Hey guys, this is 182. Welcome back to Zoo Tycoon Complete Collection. In the last part, we built exhibits for the two cephalopods in this game. The Pacific Octopus and the Giant Squid. In this part, we're going to take a look at the two rays in this game. See, it's the manta ray is huge. Yeah, the sawfish is much uh, much uh, smaller. So, I'm going to want to putting a filter there. So I'm going to uh, borrow part of that tank. This ought to be big enough. Quick disclaimer if you are below the age of, if you are below the age of eighteen, uh don't look up the Saw franchise, just just don't. If you're above the age of 18, still probably don't. It's, um... Yeah, no. So, Sawfish needs rocks and foliage, and I did make it big enough. It's gonna be a pain to build anything in it, but it's big enough. And I have a filter there. Uh, let's quickly put that. They they like the stove pipe sponge there we go and Atlantean rocks Alright, so, you might be wondering, I thought you said you were doing rays. What's up with the sawfish? Isn't that, isn't that thing like a shark or something? No. The common sawfish, uh, priestess priestess, or priestess, either way, it's a subspecies of the ray family. Uh, incidentally, before I read about them. I should actually make sure they're cared for and don't like die as I'm reading about them. Alright, so Pristis Pristis. They are sometimes known as sharks with swords. Yes, that this is if you if you're thinking of the sawtooth shark and you you probably picture this but this is not the sawtooth shark the sawtooth shark is something else entirely the sawfish is a ray uh, because they're difficult to capture observe or keep in captivity they are still somewhat of a mystery in the fish world like its cousin the shark the sawfish has a cartilaginous skeleton and a tall dorsal fin, and its skin is covered with fine scales called denticles. Like other rays, the sawfish has a flat body with a dark back and white belly. These colors camouflage the sawfish against observers above and below. Uh, sawfish can grow up to 23 feet long and weigh up to a ton. Um, no. Uh, that, that, the, the other sawfish. Hang on. 
Hang on. First of all, did I just buy two female sawfish? Oh, okay, good, I did do that right. So, there are two main types of sawfish. The small tooth, pictured here, and the large tooth, which is the one that's actually pristis pristis, which is the one I did the research on. Uh, to be fair, they might have just been considered the same thing at the time Zoo Tycoon was created, but um, the numbers here are going to differ a lot from what I have. The most noticeable feature of the sawfish is its saw, a flat protruding snout lined on both sides with sharp scales. The saw makes up about 25% of the sawfish's overall body length. Each saw has 12 to 30 pairs of scales that make up the teeth of the saw. The saw teeth continue to grow throughout the animal's life and can even regenerate if broken off. Yeah, so note here, 12 to 30 pairs. Uh, that right there is telling me that they are combining the small tooth sawfish and the large tooth sawfish as the same sawfish. They are very very similar but have enough distinct distinct distinctions that they are two separate species. Another interesting feature of the sawfish are the, the spiracles located behind its eyes. These organs look like ears but are actually used to inhale water. Water is then exhaled through the gills on the sawfish's belly. Because its eyes and spiracles are located on top of its body, the sawfish can see and breathe even when partially buried in the mud. The sawfish feeds on small fish, crabs, shrimp, and other small invertebrates on the sea or river floor. The sawfish uses its distinctive snout to detect, reveal, and attack its prey. Um, for the record, the for most of its prey, it detect and reveal, and they swallow whole like a lot of marine animals. Uh, they will slash at schooling fish, and they will try to crack some crustaceans. The saw is electroreceptive and motion sensitive, picking up the heartbeats of buried invertebrates and the motions of passing fish. If the prey is buried, the saw can be used as a rake, flushing the prey out into the open. When the sawfish attacks a school of fish, the saw is used as a weapon, slashing from side to side. The sawfish can then consume the injured, fi injured fish at its leisure, crushing them in its mouth before swallowing them whole. Yeah, so reasons that people think that electroreceptiveness is usually distinctive to, sh to sharks, which again causes confusion between the sawfish and the sawtooth shark. Anyway, unlike most other fish, sawfish can travel between fresh and salt water at will. In fact, females must travel to fresh water to give birth to their young. Sawfish are found along the coasts, estuaries, bays, rivers, and creeks of tropical and subtropical waters all over the world. Despite their ability to survive in so many habitats, sawfish are rare today. The saw is sought after as a souvenir and for its supposed medicinal qualities, but sawfish are more often killed accidentally, entangled in nets meant for other fish and seafood. Once the toothy saw is entangled in the net, escape is nearly impossible. So, notes on the common sawfish, which is uh, pristis pristis. Uh, grows bet between 10 to 20 feet, weighs about half a ton. I could not find a speed for it because it's really hard to get information 
from about an animal that a lot of information, like with the giant squid, comes from uh, accidentally caught corpses. Because, quite frankly, if you accidentally net a, saw a sawfish, you're not going to go try and free it, probably. It's, uh, it's got that saw. Anyway, their lifespan is anywhere from 30 to 80 years. Based off of what comes out of the net, I would assume they are solitary creatures. Uh, these are critically endangered. Like, you know what it said about being all, like, over half the world? They're now... They, they live in the shallow and temperate and tropical waters, in theory around the world, mostly in the western Atlantic, primarily the best guess is that the bulk of the common sawfish are in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, or at least there are more there than anywhere else, but yeah. The uh, critically endangered means they are anywhere from a couple hundred remaining to a couple thousand, which is still not much. Consider even if it even if it was two thousand all across the world. It sounds like okay. Let's put it this way. Take all of Eurasia put 2,000 humans there you need to add just as a scale to understand that should be a rough comparison for how rare a sawfish is it would be like trying to find one of 2,000 people who are the only people in Eurasia uh Continuing on, uh, they give live they give live birth to one to thirteen pups, um, and there are very few natural predators. Certain large sharks, like the great white and tiger shark, will go after the sawfish, and Occasionally, a saltwater crocodile will go after sawfish. Funnily enough, the orca, as far as I could find, does not bother with the sawfish. My, my guess is they have so much other food to choose from, they're like, screw that. I'm not dealing with the saw in my belly. I'll just eat everything else. So yes, sawfish are critically endangered. Um, and we know surprise we know so little about them. Uh, it would be great to um, learn more about them like before they go extinct. Um, I I hope that's obvious. But it they're such fascinating creatures. Can't get this lined up.
Yeah. Um, but they could be going the way of the Tasmanian tiger, uh, which, which is an animal that there is recorded video of that has since gone extinct. Um, now it did it did go extinct before color uh, video video recording, but still. Yeah, it, it, it's really disappointing. Disappointing is an understatement. Probably more depressing that um, that um, that there are so many uh, species on the brink of extinction some of which we can actually do something about um, I mean, some of them will some will, would go extinct from uh, uh, just from population shifts and and uh, invasive species which in large part, humans are responsible and will be responsible for. I mean, almost by definition, invasive species happens because of humans. Uh, off the top of my head, I can't think of any natural invasive species. Um... Then, of course, with um, with population shifts, humans are responsible for quite a bit of it. Given that, where I, as I mentioned, like. Most of these whales, they live in arctic environments, which are getting smaller. All some of the ones that live in the tropics are having to leave the tropics. It's um yeah, it's rather de it's rather depressing to to realize that um, there are a whole bunch of endangered species that humans are directly responsible for the endangerment of, even aside from poaching or overfishing or anything like that. Yeah. Okay, that's enough of depressing stuff. Let's talk about manta rays. The diamond-shaped manta, Byro Byrostris, is commonly known as the manta ray. This cartilaginous fish is the largest of the rays. The largest manta rays measure almost 30 feet from tip to tip, with weights exceeding 3,000 pounds. The average specimen grows to be about 22 feet wide. Most individuals are black or brown on top, 
but their mottled undersides have distinctive patterns that allow humans to tell one ray from another. Manta rays have a short and thin tail with a small dorsal fin at the base. Unlike other members of the ray family, they have no stinging barbs on this tail. With eyes on the side of their head, they can keep an eye out for predators in all directions. Uh, quick note, that would be the eyes here and there. Like other sharks and rays, the manta has a cartilaginous skeleton. Unlike most fish, the manta has some control over its internal temperature. Special blood vessels found around the brain help prevent helps prevent special blood vessels found where, around the brain helps prevent thermal shock when the manta dies. It should be helps special blood vessels help prevent. Yeah. Uh, and fun fact, Manta Ray has, if I recall correctly, uh, the the largest brain of any fish. Yes, they're fish. No, I'm not going to go into the taxonomical breakdown. Basically, it basically. fish split from mammals, so if it's underwater and not a plant, mammal, fungus, or prokaryote, it's a fish. Despite its formidable appearance, the manta ray is a gentle filter feeder. The manta uses its filtering plates in its gills to separate plankton and small fish larvae out of the water it breathes. Using flaps near the mouth called cephalic lobes, the manta scoops more plankton-rich water towards its gills. These cephalic lobes are kept furled when the animal is not feeding. The acrobatics of the manta ray are thought to create turbulence in the water in order to trap more plankton in their cephalic lobes. Acrobatics. I guess acrobatics is a valid word there. The manta feeds exclusively through its gills. The hundreds of tiny teeth in its mouth are vestigial and not used for any purpose. Side note: vestigial body parts are are uh, body parts that do not currently serve a purpose that are thought to have served a purpose uh, in. Um, in past ancestor species. Some manta, manta rays have uh, vestigial teeth. Uh, humans have a vestigial tailbone and, a, and an appendix. I think that's it for vestigial body parts on humans. But basically Manta ray's teeth are as useful to it as the tailbone is to us. Which, in my opinion, is more important than the... or is better for us than the appendix, because the, the appendix can explode and your tailbone can't. Well, burst. Rotten. I'm not going there. Not going there. Man manta rays are primary pelagic, meaning they live in the middle of the water column rather than at the surface or the deeps. They will swim towards the surface to feed or bask. Manta rays are harmless, with no usable teeth or stinging spines, but they have few predators to worry about. Yeah, I like imagine one of the... In addition to, like, all these spikes and spines and claws and poison those are all great defenses but also one of the best defenses in the animal kingdom is just being really really big just like so big if you're, if you're big enough 
like nothing's coming after you because you're just too big. Some sharks and large cetaceans, like orcas, will sometimes attack a young manta, but they are otherwise left in peace. They are frequently found with remora living on them, eating parasites and small pieces of food off their skin. They will also approach cleaner fish to have the parasites that often plague them eaten away. Mantas are also willing to let divers pet and scratch them in a way very similar to the cleaner fish. However, too much scratching can lead to infection and disease. I don't know why they felt the need to specify that. I'm fairly certain that on just about every single um, creature that can get infections, scratching it too much can lead to infection. I mean, something like, I don't know. Um, like, like, even if you were to scratch, like, a turtle's shell, eventually you'd get to a point where that even that would lead to infection. Yeah, so basically, while you can touch manta rays, don't scratch them. Just generally don't scratch other... Uh, and, and any other living creature unless they want to be scratched and even then limit your scratching All right. the small tail of the manta ray cannot be used for propulsion I would never have guessed instead the pectoral fins have strong muscles that move the outer body or wings the flapping motion of these wings creates the forward momentum for the manta the shape of the manta's body creates the hydrodynamic lift needed to keep it in the water column when it is motionless. Yeah, they use hydrodynamic here, but in <clears throat> but when talking about, I think it was the short fin mega shark, they said aerodynamic. But they know the word hydrodynamic exists and how to properly use it. I now want to know how many different people were working on the animal facts. <clears throat> the manta ray is found in tropical and subtropical oceans throughout the world. Scientists think that mantas in different oceans may be different species, but no one has yet proven this. Although the nomadic manta ray is often solitary, they occasionally migrate in small groups. Like many sharks, the egg of the manta ray hatch inside the female. <clears throat> Single pups and occasionally twins are born alive in a process known as aplacental viviparity. You might remember that phrase from the sharks. Basically, eggs hatch, the developing pup eats the eggs, the, fe the mother continues to produce infertile eggs for sustenance until the pup is ready to come out. <clears throat> Some observers say the mother manta will breach and eject her pup into the air while giving birth. Well, um. Okay, that's not anything that came up on any reputable source I came across. Once born, the four-foot-wide pups can jump entirely out of the water. Adults can only breach, lifting their heads out of the water before re-entering. Well, yeah, the, the bigger you get, the less powerful you are relative to your size, provided you keep the same dimensions. So... The manta ray. Now, did it give a size? I think they said 3,000 pounds. Yeah, since then, that's been upped to the largest one at 5,300 pounds. 
They tend to drift along at about 10 miles per hour, but if they need to do a short burst, they can go up to 22 miles per hour, uh, live about 20 years. <laughs> they are vulnerable, so not quite endangered, but they're close. Um, I don't think it mentioned it here, but just like sharks, uh, rays have denticles. Now, part of this has to do with taxonomy. Um, rays and sharks are both offshoots of... Uh, I can't remember the name of it, but they're both offshoots of the same previous layer. That's it. And that, I mean, in general, they did a really good job on describing the manta rays. I don't really have that much, really didn't have that much more to add. 180 flip with a, uh, with an instantaneous 90 degree turn in the middle. Spoiler alert, they don't do that in the wild. Well, that is all the, what the heck is going on with the tiger sharks? I mean, first off, there are a ton of them. Obviously, that's a problem. Second thing is, why is the tank green? They're still in a suitable exhibit, but I mean, I, it's green. None of the other ones are green. Why can't I have a second filter? Anyway, uh, those were the two rays uh, in the game. Uh, one of which, uh, both of which, are uh, need conservation efforts to survive. One of which is critically endangered and is honestly one of my absolute favorite looking. Uh, rays. I mean, the Manta Ray's classic ray style. Other rays are similar to it. The Sawtooth one is just it's just like it's a ray that kind of acts like a marlin fish and has the powers of a shark. So Yeah, it's really... What the hell? Um, also, there's magic floating kelp. Just... J just there. Anyway, I think that's enough for now. So please do remember to like or dislike and or comment and or subscribe as the algorithm demands. But for now, this has been 18.2, and I will see you guys next time.